Praise the Lord. Well, I got a, a new book that I started reading just this past week from my friend Rich Wilkerson called Sandcastle Kings, and uh, we're going to get that book in the bookstore, but it got me thinking about how much I loved as a kid building sandcastles, and uh, how many of you guys loved going to the beach or still love going to the beach? You know, the Arkansas River Beach, <laughs> Lake Keystone Beach, <laughs> Illinois River Sandbar, and... Um, I loved any chance that I got to go and play in the sand, but especially when our family would go to the ocean and, and get that privilege of being near the water and playing with the sand. And me and my brother, we would spend at least an hour or more building a sand castle. We would sculpt it and, and poke windows into it, and build ravines around it, make little you know rivers around it, just build it so beautiful and pretty. And then we'd start playing sports in the sand. We would make sure we weren't getting anywhere close to our sand castle because we wanted it to stand up strong. But every sandcastle builder knows this, that at the end of the day, when the waves start to rise and the tide starts to come in closer on the beach, all of a sudden that castle starts getting threatened, right? And at that point, you can't move the sandcastle. You can only hope that you built it far enough from the waves that it wouldn't get destroyed. And I remember many times building it and just watching and waiting, and sure enough, the waves would come in and completely wash away my sandcastle. And I think about in life, we all know some sandcastle builders, some people who are building their lives on the sand. That shaky, uh, unstable foundation that they've built their life on things that are, that are vulnerable to collapse. You know, I think about in our own nation in 2007, in December, uh, there was a recession that hit. And all through 2008, the, the housing market, the big bubble, it bursted a trillion dollar business bursted and banks were taking back houses and repossessing cars and millions of jobs were lost in our nation. It was a dark time. In fact, many people said it was just as close to being dark as the Great Depression that hit America 90 years ago. And so when I think about just what it means to build our life on the sand, I think something that's unstable. And you might be listening to this today saying, you know, my, my life's built on the rock, I'm good, Paul. I'll buy this CD for somebody else who's building on the sand. I'll, I'll copy the link, I'll send it to someone else this week. But the truth is, today I think God wants us to all look and, and really check introspectively, am I building my life on the rock or on the sand? The truth is, building our lives on anything but Jesus is vulnerable to collapse. Building your life on anything but Jesus will always leave you vulnerable to collapse. It's okay to have things, but it's not okay for things to have us. It's okay to have money, it's okay to have admiration, but the devil is in this all out war to turn our admiration into idolization so he can steal our firm foundation. See, the devil will get you to like something so much that if you were to lose that thing or that person, your world would collapse. I think about uh, an interview with, I think, the greatest basketball player in the world, Michael Jordan. People today are saying maybe LeBron James is better, but I think, how many of y'all think Michael Jordan's the best? Okay, there's the real fans right there. Doubles. And um, I remember this interview that happened just a year ago with Michael Jordan, they asked him, how's it going now that you're not playing, you're not in the league, you were the best basketball player in the world, in the history of basketball, and he said, I'm miserable. He said, I am miserable. I wake up, I go to sleep just wishing I could get back on that court and play in the NBA again, play basketball. Here he is, you know, in his 50s, and he's miserable. He said, man, I'm, I'm depressed out of my mind. I just want to play again. He said, basketball is life. And so we hear that word, and we think, yeah, 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 basketball is life. But do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, basketball is my foundation for happiness. Basketball is my foundation for self-worth. When I'm playing on that court, man, I feel important. I feel praised. I feel valuable. And you might say, man, yeah, that's athletes, the rich and the famous, they really deal with this whole thing of building sandcastles. But I would even say all of us are tempted to build our happiness, our self-worth on our career, success, living in America, having talent. You know, I think about these football players and athletes, not just football players, but athletes who can be extremely talented, but in minutes, what took a lifetime to build their platform in minutes can be destroyed. What takes a lifetime to build can be destroyed in minutes. 
They jump up for a pass and someone hits them at just the right angle and all of a sudden their career is over. Their talents are no longer there. What are we building our lives upon? What are we building? It takes, what takes a lifetime to build can be destroyed overnight and that's why I'm preaching this sermon to build your life on the only firm foundation. So let's dive into the word and just look at some people who've built sandcastles and maybe we could relate a little bit. Maybe we could see, you know what? Maybe Jesus isn't just talking to that guy 2,000 years ago. Maybe Jesus is talking to this guy right here in this room, this girl, whoever you are, wherever you're at, whatever season you're in, there's always a temptation for the devil to pull your devotion from God to something else, anything else, even a good thing. So let's go to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark 10, verse 17. Jesus was coming through this town and word got around. Jesus was a very famous miracle worker at this time. I mean, people were talking about Jesus. He had done all kinds of miracles. And so this super wealthy young guy, which would be equivalent to like Mark Zuckerberg today. And if you don't know Mark Zuckerberg, he's the, the founder of Facebook, the largest social media website in the world. More people are in Facebook than any other social media. Uh, he's got billions of dollars and he's like 34 years old. So this is like this young billionaire that nobody knows what to buy him for his birthday because he has everything he needs. You know, some people like that are like, what am I gonna get you for your birthday? You have whatever you want. But he comes to Jesus. This young billionaire comes to Jesus. In fact, he doesn't just walk towards Jesus. It says he runs towards Jesus. He falls on his knees and he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says this, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Now I wanna stop right there. We need to deal with the motives of this man's question. He's not just asking, how can I get to know you, Jesus? How can I follow you, Jesus? How can I live for you, Jesus? He's saying, how can I get into heaven? What do I have to do? Back up one scripture. What do I have to do to inherit heaven? Like, what's the checklist? Tell me what I have to do so that way after this life, I can get what I want. And there's a lot of Christians living with this one question. It sounds good, but the motives are wrong. Everything they're doing for God is just to get to heaven. But Jesus isn't just interested in us wanting to get to heaven. Jesus is interested in us wanting heaven to get into us. Wanting for us to allow heaven to invade our lives, even on this earth, before you die, to let heaven become a part of who you are, to let an organic relationship develop. This man wasn't interested in a relationship. He was just interested in the benefits of a relationship. There's a lot of Christians like this. And so Jesus says, okay, first of all, the only one who's good is God. But second of all, let me answer your question. You know the checklist. And by the way, Jesus, he can spot a checklist Christian from miles away. There's a difference between a checklist Christian and an intimate Christian, an intimate follower of Jesus, wanting to know God more, wanting God to invade their lives. And so Jesus says, here's the checklist. You know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your dad, honor your mom. And by the way, these are all good things. These aren't bad things. These are the things we should be doing. But why you do them is just as important as if you do them. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. Make sure you're not sleeping. Nudge your neighbor, say, wake up, this is for you. Okay, why you do these things is just as important as if you do these things. Because if you're only doing them so you can get the bare minimum to get into heaven, well, then your motives are off. We should be doing these things because it's a byproduct of loving Jesus and experiencing Jesus' love for us. It's like I don't go to my wife on a daily basis and say, what do I have to do to stay married to you? What do I have to do for you to stay married to me? Well, tell me that you love me. Uh, tell me, you know, all, all the things. We could go through the checklist, but that's not organic. That's forced. Anything that's forced, is, it's, it's, it's going to collapse. It, you're going to burn out. But when it's organic, man, I love my wife. I tell her I love her because I truly do. I'm not just doing it so we can stay married and one day say, hey, we reached 45 years of marriage. No, I'm doing it because I want a relationship that's intimate, that's real, that's not forced. I don't want just a checklist marriage. I want an intimate relationship. I don't want something that's stale, that's vulnerable to collapse. I want something that's strong. 
So Jesus brings this guy back to the checklist and he says, okay, have you done these things? And the young man responds, I've done all of these things since I was a teenager. Jesus, I had the Christian bumper sticker. I had the fish on the back of my car. I went to DC Top Concerts. I wore Christian t-shirts. Man, I went to Audio Adrenaline and Newsboys and I memorized scriptures and I went to Sunday school. I've done it all. Jesus says, okay, you're a good boy. I get it. You're a Christian. But there's more. Jesus said, there's one thing you're lacking. One thing. Everybody say one thing. He says, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure. Everyone say treasure. Treasure. I love that Jesus isn't saying like, hey, give it all up, and there's nothing good left for you. Follow me, and it's going to be the most miserable life that you could have. No, he says, follow me, and you'll have treasure. It is so much more valuable to follow me than it is to follow your own desires. And he says, you'll have treasure in heaven. Come and take up the cross and follow after me. And the the response of this guy, I think, is the most important part. This is where we realize what we're building on, how we're building our houses. He says he was sad at this word that Jesus spoke. He went away extremely sorrowful because he had great possessions. We're going to leave that scripture up there and let it sink in. Jesus isn't against possessions in your life. He is against possessions owning you. And here's the question. Do you own your possessions or do your possessions own you? Do you own your money or does your money own you? He was sad because Jesus was asking him to give up something that his happiness was connected to. He had built his foundation on this right here, money. He was saying, look, this is my foundation, Jesus. Don't take this away from me. This is a solid... foundation. Oh man, I I worked so hard for that money and it was taken overnight. I worked so hard. I I earned that money. Let me find another foundation. Okay, my social status. I'm influential. Jesus, I've been working hard on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I've been building some influence in my life. I know this is a firm foundation. Why isn't it holding up? Because nothing you make in this life for yourself can go into heaven with you. There is nothing you build on this earth that you can take up there. Jesus wasn't trying to make this man miserable. He was trying to let heaven invade this man's life while he was still on earth. He was saying, listen, I'm okay with you having money. It takes money to build the kingdom of God. I'm not asking you to no longer have money. I'm asking you to let the kingdom of God come first in your money. Let the kingdom of God come first with your possessions. I'm not saying you can't own anything. Of course, Peter, James, and John, they owned robes. They had places to go. They had friends and family. It wasn't Jesus saying, you can't have anything. He was saying, if I'm not first, then you're on shaky ground. If I'm not your foundation, you are vulnerable to collapse, and great will be your fall. You know, even ministry is a shaky foundation. So many ministers will substitute ministry for a relationship with God, but it's not. It's, it's, it's work. It's, when you're working under the Lord, it's all holy, but it's still work. A relationship with God is separate from doing ministry, and so many people, I remember watching my parents counsel ministers who had built these amazing ministries, and then they would experience these great falls, and they would say, what did I do wrong? And I remember just listening to the wisdom of my dad and mom saying, you put your happiness, you put your security, your trust in something that was shakable. The only thing that's not shakable is Jesus. So what Jesus says to this young man, he says, yeah, praise God. He says, what are you devoted to? Who are you devoted to? Where is your full devotion? You know, if God gives us him his full self, he's fully devoted to us. The only response back is fully devotion unto him. Because that's the only way to build our house on the rock. We can't be partially building on the rock and partially building our life in the sand. We've gotta be fully devoted to God. That's how you build your life on the rock. You know, I I had the chance, the privilege to be near the Pacific Ocean not too long ago and I, I walked outside, I had woken up because I was in Central Standard Time and so It was 5 a.m. in California, but it was 7 a.m. in Oklahoma. So I woke up, it's 5 a.m., 
and I was thinking, I can't go back to sleep, so I'm walking, I walk towards the beach, and something crazy was happening. I heard these giggles behind me, and these feet, these footsteps running on the sand, running towards the water. It was 60 degree water in this Pacific Ocean part where I was at, 60 degrees. I mean, it was freezing. Put my foot in there, and it was so cold. I didn't yeah, and these people are running to the ocean and they're jumping in the ocean with clothes on and they have surfboards and they're laughing, high-fiving each other and I'm like, they're not gonna last five minutes. It is so cold. I'm not talking like 10, like 60 surfers ran out there at 5 a.m. laughing, excited, splashing, waiting to catch a wave. They were so excited to be out there to catch a wave and I sat there and they stayed in the water for over an hour and then they kept saying, I just left. I came back later that day, and there they were in the afternoon waiting for the next big wave. They weren't going to the ocean because they had to. They were going to the ocean because they wanted to. They weren't going to surf because it was an obligation. They were going to surf because it was an opportunity. And when we look to Jesus as an obligation in church and reading the Bible and praying, man, it's forced, it's, it's stale, it's unstable. But when we look to Jesus, the way that he wants us to look to him, to say, man, you're, you're my firm foundation. You're word of God. It's like a wave. I can't wait to catch the next wave and ride it all day. I can't wait to ride on, on this scripture and, and eat it. This is food to our soul. This isn't an obligation. This is an opportunity. Every day, Jesus is saying, come on. Come on, catch the next wave. Ride the next wave. It's an organic relationship. Jesus says something else in, in Mark 17. The next scripture he says to this young man who walks away sad, he says, it's almost impossible how hard it is for people who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now, just to put this in perspective, because you're here this morning or if you're watching online on a computer, you're wealthy. The fact you live in America, you have food to eat, clothes to wear, you are wealthier than 95% of the world. Even poor people in our country are wealthier than 90% of the people in the earth. We here in America, or those watching online, we have so much more than we realize. So what Jesus is saying here, it's not just, he's, he's not just saying this to like multi-billionaires, he's saying it to people who have a lot. Here's a story to kind of help put this in perspective. I was in Nicaragua last year and we were ministering in people's houses and we got to this one woman's house who was one fourth the size of this stage. She had six children, she had three cots built up like a bunk bed on both sides. They slept right on top of each other in a super small dirt floor house and it wasn't like a house with wood. It was made of mud and sticks and all kinds of stuff. And we come and we bring her groceries. And the leader I was with, he looks at her and he holds her hands and he says, one day, God will wipe every tear from your eye and there will be no more poverty and there will be no more cancer and there will be no more heartache. She had been left by her husband to take care of these six kids. She's weeping and she goes, I know, I know, I know. She said, I'm looking forward to that. Now, if you say that to someone in America, who has a, an apartment, a dorm room, a house, who has food to eat, has a job, has money. It's a little different. It's not like this sense of like, yeah, I can't wait to get out of here. We have a hard time because there's a little bit of security in the riches and the blessings that we have. There's a little bit too much clinging to the stuff that we have here. And by the way, none of the stuff we have here is even close to comparable to being with Jesus or having the treasures of heaven that Jesus has provided. And so Jesus isn't against us having wealth. He's not saying it's hard for rich people to go into heaven. Here's what he's saying. Here's why it's hard for rich people. The next scripture, he gives the answer. He says, it's hard, verse 24, because they trust in their riches. That's what makes it hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Their trust is in a shakable foundation, right? They've got the possessions and they're saying, this is my foundation. As long as I have my house, I feel secure. As long as I have a car, transportation, a job, right? I feel secure. This makes me happy. I can count on these things. <laughs> what? No, you can't. Don't make the pastor hurt himself today and end up on YouTube. You can't fix your life on a shaky foundation. Are you catching it this morning? 
This is a good word right here. I want us to say this together. A good thing becomes a bad thing when we make it the foundation thing. A good thing. How do you know when you're building your house on the sand? Well, if we could take it away from you, would you still be happy? If it was gone overnight, your talent, your job, your kids, your spouse, your parents, your grandparents, your grandchildren, everything. If it was gone, would you still be happy? Would you still feel valuable? A few weeks ago, I came home and I've been so excited coming home these last few months because my son Liam is at a stage right now where he runs to the door and he grabs my legs and he goes, dad, dad, and it just makes me feel so loved, so valuable, so important. Well, I came home like two weeks ago and I had gotten back from church, from being here at the church and I walked through the door and he wasn't there. And I knew mom was home, Ashley's car was outside, so I knew he was there. I go, Liam, Liam. Daddy's home. I'm so desperate for love. <laughs> I walk into the living room. After a minute, still no reply. I see him. He's sitting on the floor playing with his toy, not even looking at me. And I'm like, Liam, Liam. Finally turns around and he's like. <sighs> and it hurt a little bit. And I sat there for like 10 minutes waiting for a hug. It still hadn't happened yet. And, and finally, I just kind of vocalized my, my feelings. I was like, man, why isn't Liam giving me a hug? And Ashley was like, are you gonna be okay? You gonna make it? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not gonna be okay. I need that hug to feel good. But I realized something was off, guys. And I know it sounds funny, but in that moment, I had to just repent, because I was like, I have put so much pressure on my son to meet my self-importance, my validation. And it's, it's unfair. It's unfair for my son. It's unfair for me. And it's unstable. And how many parents have staked their self-worth in their kids? And how many kids have staked their self-worth in their parents? And it's just idolatry. I hate to break your bubble this morning, but it's idolatry. I would be unfaithful as a pastor to tell you that your kids and your parents are the perfect foundation for you to build your happiness on. They're not. They're human. They will fail you. They will hurt your feelings, and you will wake up one day feeling unworthy, unvaluable, because you staked your foundation on something unstable. Anything but Jesus is going to be shaky, and I mean anything including your pastor, when you put the kind of pressure on a human being to meet all your happiness and your security and your sense of I'm saved because he's in the room and I feel good, I can read the word because he's preaching it. No, our foundation can only be in Christ. Nothing else can satisfy us. Nothing else can keep us strong and steady. People will let you down. Jesus goes on to say this in verse 25. Watch this. Watch. This is so wild. He says, it's hard for people to enter into the kingdom of God who put their trust in their riches because it's like a camel going, trying to go through the eye of a needle. Everybody say, eye of a needle. Eye of a needle. It is more easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. My, my son has this uh, little tunnel that he plays with and he pulls out and he, he loves going through this, and he laughs so hard when daddy tries to go through it too. But I had this vision. I was watching him go through it, and I imagined what following Jesus is really like. Because Jesus said, the road that leads to destruction is wide, and tons of people are on it, and they don't even realize it. But narrow is the path that leads to Christ. Narrow. And I had this vision, kind of like Alice in Wonderland, that these small doors, this small door was the entrance into heaven, and that there's just certain things that can't fit through that tunnel, through that door. No matter how hard you try, you could say, okay, God, I'm bringing America with me, I'm bringing my success, I'm bringing my talents. Okay, now I can follow you, I feel secure. Oh, okay. It's not coming through, it won't fit. Hopefully I can get through this in Jesus' name. <laughs> oh.
I'm gonna make it, I promise. You're dismissed. No, I'm just kidding. I think so many of us are trying to squeeze whatever we can on this path, and Jesus is saying it won't fit. Come on. Come on. You guys are way too fun. You're the best church in the world. But listen, we didn't bring anything into this life, and we can't take anything out. You can't take your house, you can't take your skills, you can't take all your money. And this young man, he had his bubble burst. I mean, he was like, wait a minute, those possessions are everything to me. I, I need those possessions to feel secure. I need my wealth, my money to feel happy. I need that, God. And Jesus isn't saying you can't have it, but he is saying it can't have you if you wanna follow me. If you wanna follow me, it just won't fit as an idol. Band, I want you to come up as I get ready to close because the longer you follow Jesus, it becomes an eye of a needle. The door and the path gets more narrow by the day. The longer you follow him, the more he says, we're gonna take that. I'm gonna strip that off. That pride, that ego, that need for his approval just won't fit. Some of us are building on the sand. We don't even realize it. We don't even realize it until it's taken away, until Jesus says, that can't fit. You are trying to bring that along and it's become an idol. It's okay to admire it, it's not okay to idolize them. It's okay to admire your heroes, your mentors, your pastor, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your grandparents. It's okay to admire them, it is not okay to idolize them. When it becomes an idol, Jesus says, that's got to go. It's got to go. And it's not that he takes it away from you so you can never have it again, because God's not the author of death, and he's not the author of theft. Come on, somebody. The devil is the destroyer. He's the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I'll tell you what God does do. He causes us to look to him as our only God. He says, I will have no other God before me. I won't put up with it. I won't put up with any other idol that you place in front of me. And so we have to come to that place humbly. We have to come to that place to say, okay, God, I don't want anything to own me except you. I want your lordship. Really, the bottom line of the sermon is this. If he isn't Lord of all, then he isn't Lord at all. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. If he's not Lord of all of you, your attitude, your heart, your money, your possessions, your job, your, your skills, your talent, your education. I know it's a joke that I had America up here, but so many people think somehow this is going to protect us. It's not. It's not. I am thankful to be an American. I am thankful for the leadership in our country. I'm thankful for the military. But at the end of the day, my security and protection is in Christ alone. This is the only firm foundation. This right here is the cornerstone. You can't collapse when you're standing on Jesus. You just won't fall. He is Lord of all. He's firmer than America. He's firmer than the gas prices. He's firmer than the economy. He's more firm than your spouse. He's more firm than your children. He's more firm than your grandchildren. He's more firm than your career. He's more firm than your talents. Your success, it's just collapsible. But Jesus, 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 this is it. He's the only thing. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. <sighs> Jesus. The greatest investment we can make with our lives, with our talents, our money, is the kingdom of God because it's the only thing that you can go with into eternity. When you use it for His glory, when you use it for His glory, 
It's one thing to sing, I'm fully devoted to you, Lord. It's another thing to show, I'm fully devoted to you, Lord. Here's my tithe. It all came from you anyway, so here's 10% of the money I have this week because it's all yours anyway. And whatever I spend it on here on earth, man, it dies here on earth. But when I spend it for the kingdom of God, when I invest in helping the poor, advancing the gospel, buying more Bibles, helping the church bring hope to the city of Tulsa and the nations of the earth, well, that I can take into eternity. And I think I would love to see the day where 100% of us, guests and members, understand the value of being fully devoted to God with all that we are. And that we don't just sing it, we don't just say it, but we show it. Jesus wasn't saying that people who build their house on the sand don't believe in God, don't listen to the word of God, don't go to church. In fact, he said, I want us to put it back up there. Matthew 7, verse 26, he said, the person who builds on the sand, Matthew chapter 7, verse 26, the person who builds on the sand is someone who hears the word of God, but doesn't do the word of God. In other words, we sit in church, we may even sing the songs, but we're not walking it out. When it comes time to give, we uh, keep our wallets tightly in our purses and in our back pockets. When it comes time to serve, when it comes time to help the poor, to be part of a Thanksgiving harvest feast, to, to bring a present to a boy or girl, that's where we go, okay, I don't mind going to church, but when you want me to give something of my life to you, that's kind of hard, but I'm telling you, he's the only firm foundation you can give towards, right? You can't take your Starbucks cup to heaven, even with it saying Merry Christmas. You can't take anything to heaven on this earth. The only thing that goes into heaven is your eternal investments into his kingdom. That goes into heaven. And so I wanna give you the chance this morning before we end, we could go right into a worship song, but I think an even greater way to worship is with our finances. Then we're gonna go into a worship song. At the end of our road, there's two things I want us to pass down, an offering envelope and an orange card that says Harvest Feast. These two things are a big deal to the church because we're about to go into the most expensive outreach season of our church. We're gonna be doing three Thanksgiving Harvest Feasts this, these next 12 days. We're gonna do one at the Dream Center, one here in the gymnasium. We're gonna do one on Thanksgiving Day for people all over our city to come to the church and eat a Thanksgiving meal. People who are from overseas who don't have family to celebrate it with. We're gonna give uh, people, we're gonna bring people on the buses, thousands of people. And we're gonna give every mom and dad a ham to go home with. We're gonna give them vegetables to go home with. We're gonna give them not just physical food, but spiritual food. And we need your help. Church, I need your help to do this. This is on top of what's regularly a responsibility for our church to pay for on a monthly basis. On top of that, we're gonna do three toy giveaways. One at the Dream Center for boys and girls who otherwise wouldn't get toys at Christmas. We're gonna do another toy giveaway right here. We're gonna bus kids in from all over the city from some of the poorest areas to give them a great Christmas gift. Then we're gonna do one for single parents, people who are just trying to make ends meet, who have a lot of kids to try and help and also feed, and we're gonna take care of them too. Why do we do it? Because that's the kingdom of God, to take care of the poor, to help the widows, to help the orphans, to be about his business. And so here's the, here's the price. I want God to speak to you what you're supposed to give today. And if you don't wanna give on the offering envelope, that's fine. You can give through text, you can give online. Maybe this week later on, you could give something. But we're believing God over the next three weeks, on top of what's regularly needed, close to $40,000 to help cover all of the harvest feast, all the toys for kids, all the buses that we're bringing kids in on, all the hams we're gonna give away. It costs a lot to do each thing we do. And we don't just give these kids a $1 toy. We give them $10 toys. We give them something nice. Why? Because you would want your kid. We give them $25 toys. We, we wanna give something that's more than just a dollar or five dollars. You know, it's amazing. We've had some people come in and say, I wanna bless, <laughs> this breaks my heart. We had a person who wasn't even a Christian who said, I wanna bless 100 kids at the Dream Center with $100 gift cards to Target. I wanna give each kid a $100 gift card to Target at Christmas time to go buy some toys. That was a non-Christian. And I thought, God, I pray that we as Christians wouldn't be so stingy 
that we miss out on what the gospel is all about. That we would be even more generous than the people of the world because we know who our source is and we know what our foundation is on. It's not on anything else but Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals everything I need. And listen, it's not about the amount you give because if you today gave $3 and you only have $5 to spend this week, well then you just gave 60% of your wealth, which is huge in God's eyes. And if you are a multi, multi-billionaire, and you give $500 today, well that's just a small fraction, it's not even 10% of what you have to spend this week. It puts things in perspective because Jesus isn't just concerned about the amount. He's saying, what do you have? What are you giving with what I've blessed you with? Because all the blessings come from God anyways. And here's the good news. I promise I'll get off the stage in just a little bit. Mark chapter 10, that same passage where Jesus is talking to the young ruler. The disciples ask him in the next scripture. They say, well, it seems impossible. Look at this. Mark chapter 10, verse 26. The disciples were astounded. He says, how in the world can we be saved? Even the disciples knew, man, we're blessed. How are we going to get into heaven if we have all these blessings? And Jesus says this in verse 27, with men, it's impossible to work your way into heaven. It's impossible. All the good deeds you could do, all the church attendance, all that stuff, you can't get in. But with God, through Christ Jesus, crucified, buried, and rose again, that is how we experience eternal life. Our salvation is in Christ alone with God. It is possible. And then the disciples ask him this question. They say, Lord, we've given up a lot to follow you. And Jesus says this, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has put the gospel, and here's what he's really saying. He's not saying who's given up all these things, but he's saying who's put the gospel, the kingdom of God, in front of these things. There's no one who's put the kingdom of God in front of house, brother, sister, son, daughter, mom, dad, for my sake and the gospel's sake, who won't inherit, watch this next scripture, this is important, a hundredfold, not just in heaven, but in this life. Jesus says, I'm going to bless you in this life. When you put the gospel in front of your possessions, in front of your relationships, in front of your career, when you put that gospel, the kingdom of God, Jesus first, when he's the foundation, he says, I'm going to bless you in this life. I'm going to bless you with houses. I'm going to bless you with land. I'm going to bless you with relationships that are rich and deep and meaningful and genuine. I'm also gonna bless you with the endurance to go through persecution for the sake of the gospel, which is joyful. The disciples counted it a joy to go through any kind of persecution for the gospel. And he says, and most of all, I'm gonna bless you with eternity in heaven. But many who are first here on this earth will be last, and those who are last on this earth will be first. So the key to building our house on the firm foundation is living for Jesus, fully devoted, Everything we have, not just lip service, but life service, saying, God, the kingdom of God comes first. The gospel comes first. If today's message ministered to you, be sure to contact us to share your story by phone or email. And be sure to follow us on social media at Victory Tulsa for daily encouragements and upcoming events. God bless you, and remember, your best days are right in front of you.